Hello and welcome to the Osmoto Show. I'm Kate Peck and I will be your guide through today's hard pounding world of two wheel and wonders. We've got you covered for on road and off road, so let's get on the gas with our stellar lineup of guests. First up, we catch up with multiple Australian off-road champion and world champion Gemma Wilson, who's been busy as a Husqvarna ambassador. Then we check in with Honda Australia's Wilson Todd in far north Queensland after his fourth Penrite Pro MX Championship presented by AMX Superstore's MX2 title win. And finally, the GOATs, the legends, the pioneers of Australians in international circuit racing sit down with Mark Brax for a bit of old school racing banter. Remember to follow along on socials using the hashtag and handle at OzMotoShow. Send us in your weekend riding vibes. We would love to see them. Now, we have to do a huge shout out and congratulations to the Penrite Pro MX Championship presented by AMX Superstore's title winners for 2023. In the Thor MX1, Dean Ferris takes his fourth MX1 title. In Pirelli MX2, Wilson Todd also takes his fourth MX2 title. And for Maxis MX3, Byron Dennis brought home the bacon. And finally, taking out the Easy Lift MXW title, the exceptionally talented Charlie Cannon. And speaking of exceptionally talented women in the studio today, we have a very special guest. She's a Husqvarna ambassador. And between us, we have five world championships. Please welcome Gemma Wilson. Gemma, it's so good to have you in the studio. You taught me that joke about the uh, five world championships between us. It's a lie. They're all yours. Absolutely, but you're not the only one that says that joke. <laughs> I'm really stoked to be here today. So good. Now, uh, you spent most of your life racing around the world. You are back in Australia creating pathways for women to now go racing through your coaching and your, your fun days. Tell us about how those programs roll, uh, roll for you. Yeah, so uh, in 2018, I retired from racing and went full time into running events and uh, predominantly coaching events and predominantly for women. So I coach everyone right from the first timer, so they get on my FE 250 and, and learn how to ride, um, right through to young racers. So I have a, a few people that I've coached over the years, junior riders um, from the AORC, which is awesome because I love coaching beginner riders because you get them so good so quick but then I love coaching young athletes as well because I get to use all that experience um, that I have and knowledge that I have from all those years racing and yeah getting women into the sport is is super awesome because it's such a massively growing part of our industry at the moment and the whole landscape has changed so much in such a short period of time and to have been a part of that is is awesome. Um, you are a four-time Australian off-road champion what are you seeing for women within um, within racing and the future of AORC? I think it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I mean, I raced Australian Off-Road Championships for, I think it was 12 or 13 seasons, so quite a long time. And it was myself, Jess Gardner, Emily Carlson and Taylor Jones mm. for the last many years. And it was us just absolutely hogging the podium in fourth place. So it was really hard for girls to come along and get some recognition for all the effort that they were putting in. Um, and then when I retired and Taylor went off to America, it really left that spot in third place um, to get on the podium open. And I really was hoping that that would get more girls to kind of catch up to Jess, because Jess has got quite the head start on everyone. Um, and it sort of hasn't happened just yet, but Jess is actually obviously um, coaching Danielle McDonald to, to take up that spot, which is awesome. And so I'm really excited to see where Danielle McDonald can take things, that's for sure. Yeah, well, speaking of um, Danielle and Jess Gardner, we've got the International Six Day coming up uh, in Argentina. Now, that is where you won your five world championships. What do you think about the selected team? Um, how are they going to go? And, and you've been to Argentina before to race the ISDE. What do you think of the terrain? It was, a, yeah, it was a really tough race and I think that the team for this year, Jess, um, Danielle and Taylor is such a phenomenally strong team. Honestly, you couldn't have a better team, I don't think. And the experience that Danielle will get mm. to boost her onwards and upwards is really, really cool. Yeah, there's definitely a correlation between AORC riding and racing in that and then our success as well within ISDE. Do you find that? Yeah, I think that the way Australia is set up is we have the Australian four day enduro, which is like a mini six days. So it's the same format. It just goes for four days. But then we also have the AORCs that allows riders to go and do that intensity riding and meet more often 
So the more you race, the better you get at racing. So with our four day once a year and our say 12 rounds of the Australian off-road championships, that is a wonderful setup for yeah. the International 16 Enduro for sure. So you're a Husqvarna ambassador. Um, how have you found that experience? I honestly have so much love for the Husqvarna brand. Um, so I've been with them since 2019 and now that I don't race, you know, I'm very much a lifestyle. I promote motorcycling as, as a really awesome lifestyle and we're such a nice fit with Husqvarna because they have such a range of bikes. And, and then the support that Husqvarna give me and women is so great. They supply so many demo bikes and they get girls on bikes. And then at my Husqvarna women's trail ride, um, Rosie, the marketing manager, she comes and she brings demo bikes and she sweep rides and helps girls up giant hills. And then, yeah, girls get a weekend where they get to try the two strokes, the four strokes, lowered bikes, not lowered bikes. Yeah, I love the support from Husqvarna and I love the brand. You are coming out of retirement uh, because you will be on a plane unbelievably soon heading to Japan. What is going on over there and, and you're racing, tell us about it. Yeah, so um, I pulled the pin in 2018 in the middle of the race season, in the middle of a race, I put my bike in the back of the van and drove home and I was like, I'll never race again, I'm done. But here I am, I'm going to Japan this evening um, to partake in the Hadaka two-day enduro in the top island. Um, and I'm going as a Husqvarna ambassador and, you know, pressure's off. I'm not, I'm going for a trail ride that happens to be timed. Um, and just finally, if there are some young girls watching this, looking, who look up to you and want to follow your path, one day become a world champion, what are some, some words of wisdom or advice that you might have for them? Um, something that I, I always say at coaching is give it a whirl. Um, you never know until you try things. So definitely, if you're interested in, in bikes and you want to go and try a race or try an event or try a hill or a log or whatever it might be, give it a whirl. And then also ask for help. The motorcycle industry is a really beautiful place um, and there are so many people that want to um, pass on their experience. So yeah, ask for help and give it a whirl. Yeah, so good. All right, Gemma, thank you so much for joining us. It has been brilliant to have you in here. Thank you so much, I loved it. And don't you go anywhere because coming up is MX2 2023 Championship winner, Wilson Todd from Far North Queensland and Mark Brax catches up with some of the legends of circuit racing this season. Over the line for the final time, 2023 oh, champion, woo! Wilson Todd. Congratulations, what a fantastic ride to close out this championship season. From the Penrite Pro MX Championship presented by AMX Superstores riding for Honda Racing Australia, the freshly crowned MX2 champion Wilson Todd joins me from far north Queensland. Wilson, what have you been up to since we popped that crown on your head and you took out your fourth MX2 championship? Bit of kicking back for a few weeks and then just the last week just been getting into some supercross. You've had some time to reflect. How did you find the season? You were dealing with a few injuries. Was this one of your hardest fought MX2 championship wins? Well, wasn't wasn't the easiest one for sure. You know, and Nathan was there the whole time, pressuring me. And um, I I feel like I picked the right times when to challenge him, when I could keep keep my points gap, and other times where I wouldn't have been comfortable. And you know, I let him have his day. You know what I mean. This wraps your second successful year working with Honda Racing Australia. How are you finding working with the team and the Honda machine? Yeah, it's been good. I mean, I think Yuri has the biggest effort in Australia, definitely in MX2. You know, he gives a lot to us as riders and he's always paranoid if he's doing it enough, which is, I guess, good. So I feel like we have the best stuff out there. Big props to Yuri. Now, 2024, I know you put up a poll on Instagram with two options, stay on a 250 or stay on a 250. Can we pretty much safely say that you might be on a 250 for 2024? Uh, I don't know. I think, um, yeah, we might, some might be surprised, some might not. Uh, but, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure when we'll find out. I know what I'm doing, but... Um, I'll leave it up to the boss. And what for you is the appeal of staying on a 250? The appeal of staying on a 250 is you know, the competition. There's definitely a lot of good riders in MX2, but not so consistent. I think Nathan was the only sort of maybe consistent rider that 
would battle every weekend. So this this year, an example, like I was unfit, unhealthy, had a lot of injury, and I could still land on the podium every weekend. And when well, now, like you have a mortgage and things like that, it's appealing that you almost guaranteed an income every week. We're in the four fifties. There's a lot of a lot of great guys. I'm not that I don't think I could beat them. It's just if I I'm not feeling right on the weekend, there's the chance you don't end up on the box. You know what I mean? Australian Supercross and World Supercross are now on the cards. How are the preparations going and what are your expectations? Uh, preparation's been going all right. So I've just been riding up to them here. I don't know if anyone's seen the track, but it was a full-size, pretty gnarly track. And I was walking it before we started riding it, like when we were still riding motocross and I was, a little, I was getting a little bit nervous. But... Uh, so as soon as I got on the track, it's like I uh, I never stopped from the start of the year. You know, when I was racing in the AMA, like, it only took me a couple of laps to do everything, and I felt a bit uncomfortable. So I guess it's going pretty good, but uh, just got to put, put in those laps so I can gain the base fitness, I guess, that I need to try and win some races. You're no stranger to racing internationally. You are highly competitive in the MX2 World Championship in Europe. But for 2024, will we see you in Australia or do you think you'll head back for some more AMA Supercross? I'll be riding here for now. Uh, I guess mainly because ever since I've sort of come even back from Europe, I've just been, I've had a bike and I've been training flat out the whole time. You know what I mean? Like Australian motocross, then America, Australian supercross, back to America, back to Australian motocross, now Australian supercross. And if I were to race in America 24, like, Straight after this championship, I'd have to be back in America to do the whole year all again without, you know, a break. And I'll just, you know, I think a break would be nice. I guess a couple of days where I'm not thinking about motorbikes would be good. But, yeah, one day for sure. All right, Wilson, we can't wait to see what goes down for you for the rest of this year and beyond. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. Stick around after the break. Mark Brack sits down with some of the legends in the world of circuit racing. We'll see you soon. Welcome back to the Osmodo Show. We were lucky enough to sit down with some of Australia's greatest ever circuit racers, and Mark Brack's got to capture it all. Let me introduce from my left Chris Vermeulen, Steve Martin, Troy Bayless, Gary McCoy to my right, and then final, finally Troy Corser over there. What a story these guys have got to tell, and we're going to find out a little bit about it. Now, just starting with you, Chris, mm -hmm. do you ever sit back and look at your results and go, did I really, did that really happen? <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. funny, isn't it? Yeah. I look at the guys now and you see you've won some races and this and that, and how fast the riders are, and I think, geez, I don't know if I could do that anymore. <laughs> yeah, and, and what you actually yeah. achieved. I don't know, do you, do yeah. you feel the same? Yeah, it feels, honestly, it feels like uh, a lifetime ago. Yeah. Um, but time passes and um, sitting here amongst us guys, like at one stage we're all rivals at some stage as well. Yeah. And as, <laughs> as time goes on, like we have such a good laugh now and we're all really good mates. Not that we ever didn't completely dislike each other. But <laughs> I, 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 I didn't like him at all. Really. There, was, there was some times, like there was some times where uh, the things were That's tough, only if there was a free beer. It's, fun, it's funny There's now, we, we laugh place. about it all, have, have a joke about it. It's, it's quite funny, hey? It is, it is yeah. good fun, isn't it? Yeah. So. What about you? You're still riding though. Yeah, I'm still riding a lot. You know, doing my race schools all over Europe. So you probably think you can still do it, not like us. <laughs> I, I still do it you, all right, actually. <laughs> it, uh, no, I, I'm pretty much riding stock bikes, road tyres, so I'm not going for lap times. Just a bit of fun, but occasionally I'll get a chance to jump on like the M bike with some slicks in it, and yeah, have a bit of a push there, and just have a bit of fun. So but you still uh, get a lot of miles in now. Oh yeah, yeah. Like I said I'm yeah. riding hours a day. Like said, no, I love it. You know, it's, I enjoy riding bikes. Keeps me fit gets me overseas a few times throughout the year as well and catch up with the family and friends over there and then move back here full time and do the same, catch up with family and friends like you guys now. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a, yeah. And even you get three 500cc GPs, you look at that and go, I beat Rossi, I beat Biaggi. It's like every man's dream to think that they could do that. To, to be able to say, you know, I've beaten Valentino Rossi and Biaggi and Caparossi and all them guys, um, you know, it's 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 
good to look back on. It's done and dusted. It's no big deal now. But um, yeah, it's something you've done, you've achieved, and uh, yeah, it was a, a great thing. Well, speaking of that, with your experiences and everything, four of you out of here have had a link with one person, Barry Sheen, Troy, Gary, you, Troy, and Chris. Without him, do you think you could have made the gap yourselves, or was it that was the big lift that you needed? I think it definitely helped myself like when i did that wild card in 97 there was um barry and bill woods were the the commentators i think for channel 10 back then and obviously i had a very good ride but they really gave me a good rap and that sort of put my name on the lips of some people and basically that was how i got my kick kick off to go to the uk in the british championship same same for me like he just opened doors a lot earlier i did did one year racing here at the end and started to get some results but i wasn't a guy this guy seemed to be in front of me a lot. He won the championship that year. And, um, but I was the young kid doing well and Barry again was the TV commentator and said, you know, if you want to look overseas, I'm happy to get some calls in for you. And it just gets that name out there and he had all the connections. And um, I mean, you still got to be the guy riding the bike and getting the results. But when those doors are opened, it, it, the opportunities come, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, I think Barry helped me a lot. Um, you know, I only did my fifth ever road race was in a Grand Prix. And <laughs> How nuts is that? <laughs> really? Yeah. It's not racing, though. It's yeah, got a GP right. in. Yeah, I only just started Proddy Race. I won the Triple Challenge. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. Which he was yeah. commentating. Yeah. yeah. Troy? Yeah, well, actually, Barry, ma massive help in my career, actually. Uh, obviously, when I was racing on the Proddies and stuff, obviously, getting results is going to help. As you said, Barry was commentator on Channel 10 there, so he was watching the whole racing series. From the super bikes down to the kids, that was what Barry was good for. He watched everybody. Yeah. Uh, really wanted to give the younger kids the opportunity, I think. Uh, and when I won the championship in '93 on the RC30 at Eastern Creek, I think Ducati put in a protest against us. So Barry actually came up and he said, "What's going on?" I said, well, "I think they're protesting." So he's throwing his arms out. Well, they protest them. You beat yeah, would have been, would have been a bit of colourful language, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah, I let a little bit out there. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a, a part of it, but. Uh, so he basically said, what do you want to do next year when you win this championship? And I said, I just want to get out of Australia if I can. So he said, give me two weeks, I'll get the extra ride. Yeah. So a week later he rings me, he goes, you got a passport? I went, yep. He goes, good, we're going to America. I'm like, where are we going? He goes, Daytona. <laughs> what for? He goes, you got a test on a bike. You've got six laps. Six laps around the I've never been there. He goes, what was that? It doesn't matter, huh? Ferrari. Yeah. I remember like watching the first thing that got me interested in the road racing was seeing Graham Crosby. So there wasn't a lot of bikes really shown on telly that much, but I, he was the first guy I've seen doing wheelies on a road bike. You know, win a race and pull a big wheelie. I was like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a long time after that before I actually started. But You were a late bloomer, yeah, weren't you? A bit of a late bloomer. Everybody but else. honestly, it doesn't really make any difference because I think your whole, your career is a window. Like if you start young, yeah. it doesn't mean you're gonna go till you're 40. You know what I mean? I think I think you've got like this window and it just starts and finishes. I don't think it's ideal to be starting too late, but it, it turned out okay for me. But um, like we, we were a little bit different in ages, but we're around, around the same time. These, mm. these guys, I remember watching these guys in production races when I was just starting and they were at the top of the game then. And I'd, I'd moved in and then it wasn't long before you guys sort of scooted off and started your, started your career. Well, it wouldn't have been me though. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you and me were pitted together at Eastern Creek for that. Yeah, triple for the challenge. triple challenge and yeah. stuff. So yeah, we had a few races together, but Troy had already sort of done his stuff and moved on. Well, you were actually went for a Honda when we we were doing that. Yeah. 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 So tell us some of the on-track antics that you guys. Was there any banter? Like not so much in the racing where you would have been elbowing each other, but no, practice but, and qualifying. Yeah, it wasn't really that much talk. Hello, how are you going? Whatever. But there was plenty of times where Troy and I would. Uh, for instance, one time at Brunei, like we were always having a good race there and Troy was always super fast there. This one day happened to be my day where I was having a great day, but I, I remember having a look over my sh shoulder and seeing Troy there and I just like give him the thumbs up. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, just a quick thumbs up and that, and that was it. Um, you know, it was good to you know, have another Aussie right there. And I'd, but more important than that, we wanted to beat someone like Biaggi. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> well, well that, the motivation was just there, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> no, but I... I was in the pay a long time with these guys. I challenged with Troy for a championship, Australian Superbikes with him. Gaz was Gaz was sort of on his way back. He'd in, done the Grand Prix thing and then into super and come into Superbikes and blew us all away at Phillip Island. A couple of races. Lost a beard, I think. 
Yes. Shaved yes. your beard off when yeah, you won you a race. Took it off. <laughs> <laughs> I was on the podium with you there. Yeah. I, th I, I think you can thank me for that too, if you yes. remember rightly. <laughs> you can also also thank Steve for doing all the hard work for the start of Pirelli's. Exactly. Because like while we were all on Michelin's or Dunlop, yeah. uh, which were a more competitive tyre, more the time. competitive tyre. Steve was doing all the hard work for the Pirelli's right from the start. He was the first guy. Like. Yeah, it was a it was a crazy time. I mean, like. Yeah. Pirelli back then, they'd make all these special tyres. They'd give me one tyre. I'd remember at Oshersleben, they gave me this tyre. I went out and like, I, I remember coming in and, and uh, Edwards and, and him, they're going, because I, I was quickest, you know, like. Yeah. But the, the problem was the race tyre was like four seconds laps lower. Oh, yeah, they had a super sticky one. Oh, yeah, well, I don't, they, they worked hard for three years to make the tyre that we use now. And, you know, the philosophy that Pirelli use has always been the same. You know, what the top guys use, the, everyone gets. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, but you had to go through a lot of hard well, times. I, I went through like, a lot of crashes. To I went through a lot of crashes, a lot of heartache. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah until that 2004 when uh, we went to the um, mono control tyre. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say before, I was on track with these guys and I've been in the paddock with Troy a lot, a lot of years. Yeah. There's only one race we've ever done together, any blitz to saw, it was Valencia 2006. Yeah, oh right. GP. Yeah, oh, wasn't yeah. a bad one for you, was it? Yeah, it was a bad one. It was a bad one. It's yeah. <laughs> 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 like you say. It's I good. was stuck behind this Yamaha with number 46 <laughs> yeah. on it until he went down. And then, <laughs> but yeah, Bloody hell, yeah, Troy ran uh, away with it. So it's the only on. race we've done together. So yeah. doing, doing things tough, there's another link between a few of you. You, Steve, Gaz, and Troy Corsi on the Patronus. Um, yeah. Troy, I always remember him saying, I said, how's the bike, how do you know how good the bike is going? Because it's three cylinder 900, and he said, well, after the warm up lap, you'd look down at your boot, and if there was how much oil was on it, yep. you'd see how much was, and then it set a cord on fire one day. We've had a, had a few I think more, more than one. Oh, day. I think it caught on fire one day for all of us, actually. <laughs> <laughs> At some stage, I, I think we had a. I'd burn a seat, but I don't think I was on fire. No, I was on fire. I was. No, I, I, I went <laughs> at Bruno, at Bruno once. I remember going out on the first warm-up lap, and my gear lever fell off. So I came in. I got my second bike, went around got parked on the grid and it was on fire. So I knew that that day was over at that point. <laughs> Not a good day. No. I had better. Yeah, yeah I had one at Monza. 80% of the track's flat out. And I remember going down the back straight and passing, uh, who was my teammate then on that? Oh, oh, James, James, James Hayden. Hayden. Yeah. I'm coming down the back straight. I look and I was like, up. Oh. His bike's on fire. <laughs> I'm like, how long's mine going to be? So I kept going, and generally we've got the flag marshals there. They're there to help us put them bikes out. And I actually stopped them. I said, just let it burn, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to ride that one again, anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, it was uh, well those things that you, know, you just heat of the moment. You sort of just get frustrated. Heat of the moment. Yeah. Get frustrated yeah. with it. Well, you had another unique experience too, guys, riding your Pilia Cube in a Grand Prix. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did that catch fire <laughs> as well? That was another yeah. Yeah, that's caught fire before, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I spit me um, Phillip Island exit in turn one. It, the, obviously had the fly-by wire and it just did something of its own and flicked me over the bars and yeah. boys are like, what happened? I said, I don't know, I was just holding it flat and it just did something and off I went. And they said, that later on they checked old Wombat, checked her out and um, he, said, he goes, oh sorry, fly-by wire failed. Did you guys like the old super pole concept? Like I loved out? it. Yeah, it was, I loved it. He yeah. wasn't. <laughs> that was real cool. Super, it was super pole king. Yeah, yeah. It was so worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, I think Sykes he actually beat me by one, so he's yeah. got the record now, and he's never got close again. I think the best part was like just going out there and having the whole, whole track, track to yourself. yourself. It was mm. cool. Hey? Yeah, it was really good concept. Oh, oh, I liked it. Took me a while to. Be quick at it. But yeah. I think that was very cool, and they, they did it to give TV coverage to to everyone. Yeah, worked well. Yeah. Well, what a special edition of the Osmodo show that was. Please thank Troy Corsa, Gary McCoy, Troy Baylor, Steve Martin, and Christian Mullen. Magnificent human beings and fantastic riders. Wow, that was so great to catch up with those legends. Excellent job, Braxy. Now, we might have wrapped up the Pro MX Championship for 2023, but Motorcycling Australia still has plenty more racing events to keep your eyeballs busy for the rest of the year. Rounds 11 and 12, the final rounds of the Yamaha Australian Off-Road Championship presented by MX Store hit Dungog in New South Wales on the 14th and 15th of October. That is going to be an exciting way to end the championship. 
The My Bike Motorcycle Insurance Australian Superbike Championship presented by Motul gets on the gas at Phillip Island for round six on the 27th to the 29th of October. The 2024 Australian Speedway Championship hits North Brisbane in Queensland for round one on January 4th. And do not forget the 2024 FIM Oceana Speedway Championship, which will be in Gilman, South Australia, at the Speedway track January 27th. And if you're keen on a bit of sidecar action, the 2024 FIM Oceana Speedway Sidecar Championship is also at Gilman, South Australia on March 9th. We wish the absolute best of luck to the international six-day enduro women's team heading over to Argentina and also to the MX of Nations crew. Good luck, everybody. We can't wait to see how you go. Thank you for watching the Osmoto Show. We'll see you next time.